Have you ever been with a group of people who consider themselves religious or spiritual, and they didn't really welcome you or pay attention to you? Have you ever been with self-identified Christians, and I'm talking any end of the spectrum, whether they're the ones that are trying to win your soul to heaven, or they see themselves as Jesus' social justice warriors, but they were just mean? The biblical witness is that we are created in the image of God. We are magnificent manifestations of the divine. You, magnificent manifestations of the divine. Jesus teaches in the Gospel of John that we are to be vessels of the very essence of divine spirit, vessels of living water, and that we then, vessels of the Spirit's living water of justice, generosity, and joy, we are to be fountains, he says, of such living water into the world, bringing what is life-giving and healing and hopeful. So, humans are that, what I just described, but also can be selfish, mean, controlling, manipulative, and do great harm. How can both things be true? Discuss that amongst yourselves, and I'll be back in an hour. I ah, just kidding. <laughs> That'd be good, though, wouldn't it? Uh, how can both things be true? Well, one way to think about that for me is that God is not coercive. So even though we are made to be vessels of that living water, to be fountains of what is just and joyful and, and uh, generous in the world, even that's who we are, we don't have to be. We're not forced to be. We're not coerced to be. Uh, that we can pay attention to spirit, to God, and then embody God's spirit in the world, but we can pay attention to all kinds of other things, and of course we do. And in the, the tradition, the biblical tradition, that gets called idolatry, or worshiping false gods. I don't know about you, but for a long time I had a, even though I'm not a literalist when it comes to the Bible, I kind of had a literalist picture of this. Because I'd think, oh, graven images, you know, a statue of Zeus or Osiris or Thor. Well, I didn't have any of those. I didn't worship those. I was off the hook. False gods, idols, not me. Then I learned that the Hebrew word often translated as idol into English, the word pasel, it actually has the sense of part of the whole. Part of the whole. The idea being that God is whole and wholeness, and to offer ourselves into God's spirit and energy and life is to receive wholeness and live wholeness, but then there are the things, whatever that's not God is only part of the whole, right? Part of the picture. And so to give ourselves to anything fully that's just partial, well then we're offering ourselves and receiving and sharing the partial, the fragmented, sometimes the broken, these little shards of life, and then in us are sometimes then the partial, which is diminished, or the fragmented, the broken, and then we're kind of pokey, and we start poking others, and we fracture and fragment and sometimes hurt. And so that's what can happen. And that's the, the circumstance and the situation being addressed in the passage that you heard from the prophet Jeremiah. So the people of Israel, they are the beloved children of God. They are created in the image of God, magnificent manifestations of the divine, a community that can be a system. We might think of an irrigation system, bringing the living water of God's spirit into the world. As a matter of fact, that's their whole founding story. That's the DNA of Israel. Here's why you exist, God says to Abraham, your people, your descendants, to bless the world. Isaiah says to be a light to the nations. That's the whole deal. That's why you're here. But the people don't have to do it. Right? It's not forced upon them. There is this element of choice. And the people have paid attention to the part of the whole. They've given themselves over to other things like political systems and economics and riches and power and control and all the stuff that humans do. Well, then they are not fully receiving what is the wholeness. Right? They're, they're not able to take in the fullness of that living water of justice and joy and generosity. So they're not then, we might say, irrigating the landscape with the justice, joy, and generosity of God. And so God speaks through the prophet of baffled distress. Why on earth would you do that? Why? Why? 
You can be in on wholeness. You can be wholeness. You can bring healing and hope and all the goodness into the world. But instead, you turned your back on me. You offered yourself to something less, and then you're bringing something less. And as a matter of fact, I I offered you to be vessels of my living water, and you made your own stuff, and there's a hole in your bucket. You are cracked pots. And that goodness that I've given you, it's just leaking out instead of being offered into the world. And that, that the prophet Jeremiah, all the prophets that you hear, it's not to shame or guilt them and then just like, oh, I'm, woe is me, but rather a call to turn around, to live into something different. And of course, the circumstance of Israel is not unique to Israel in the time of Jeremiah. It's what we might call the human condition. I mean, we all have the truth of us that we are beloved of God, that we are You are magnificent manifestations of the divine, meant to be vessels of the living water, fountains of God's living water of justice, joy, generosity in the world. But we're also cracked pots because we've entered into a world where there is fragmenting and brokenness and pain, and that hits us and cracks us and hurts us. Because I don't believe, I mean, I suppose it's possible, but I don't believe that most people wake up one day and say, I think today, instead of receiving the wholeness of God and sharing in the world, I'll just take in a little something less. And I'll just offer something less. I would like to just be manipulative and controlling and do harm. I mean, most people don't do that, right? I mean, if you do, hmm, there's forgiveness too. But still, most of us, that's not how we're thinking, right? That's not our intention. But as soon as we enter the world, we've entered into, we might say, the air we breathe is already got the brokenness, the fragmented, the partial, the less than. Literally, the very first breath any of us who are alive right now took into our bodies had toxins and pollutants in it, right? Already, the manifestation of ignorance and selfishness was already in the literal air we breathed. And so we grow up. Some of us knew a great sense of love and care and safety, but others of us, it was chaotic and hard and insecure and difficult, and most of us had a mixture of both. Some of us grew up and, as children with a sense of being celebrated and affirmed, and some of us grew up with a sense of being shamed and rejected, and most of us have known a mixture of both. And even into adulthood, right, there can be the experience in each day where sometimes there's the person who holds the door open for you, or the dear friend who's the shoulder to cry on, the people that love us and care for us. Sometimes that customer service representative that you waited on hold for three hours for actually helps. I sometimes get tearful, right? When it's like, oh, thank you for, for doing that. Because it can feel so rare. And then though, in the same day, we can also be cut off and flipped off. Right? Those things happen too. The wounds, the broken, the cracking. So of course, it gets in us. And, and it can be helpful to recognize the both and of the belovedness and belonging and the magnificent manifestations of the divine, but also there's holes in our buckets and that we are cracked pots at the same time. And that some of that goodness because of the wounds and the hurt in our lives, it leaks out. Because if we don't, if we don't see it, well, what we sometimes can do instead is what Jesus calls in the gospel passage, exalting ourselves. And I think, by the way, we come by that pretty easily, if not naturally, because if we've known wounding and hurt, well, then we want to protect ourselves. We want to kind of, you know, show up bigger or hide and get really small. But either way, there's a sense of, uh, as he puts it, exalting ourselves. It's a form of self-protection. But he's teaching us that when in the places of the wounding or the brokenness or that there's the hole in our bucket or whatever it is, to pretend it's not there and to go around more full of ourselves, well, then it ends up actually hurting us. There's a a tumbling down, and then that hurts others. And Jesus, as I've mentioned before, when he has something important to say, he tells a story. So here he tells a story in Luke's gospel about this. So you heard in the story He's, he's at a dinner party, and so he talks about one of the more formal dinner parties, the wedding banquet. And by the way, the wedding, I mean, some, anyone been to a wedding banquet before? So that's one of the few meals in our own culture where there might be a place where you're assigned to sit. Right? But mostly, right, when you go places, there's not assigned seating. 
sometimes a little bit more formal dinner party, but mostly. It's sometimes they're like, oh, well, you can just sit over here, but it's pretty casual. That's what we're used to. So this is a very striated and structured society they live in. Uh, so actually, any kind of big dinner party, there would be a place you're supposed to sit. And so same thing with the wedding banquet. And so, and everybody knows that. That's not a confusing thing for people in that culture. So Jesus is saying, imagine someone, though, who's full of themselves, who's trying to exalt themselves, which always is about somewhere deep within, knows about the brokenness and the pain, and we're trying to cover it up and not get hurt more. But that you come and you put yourself in the seat of great importance. Right? That's what exalting ourselves does. I, I think I'm all that. I don't have anything to learn. I don't have to grow. I don't need anything. But Jesus says, you can do that. But then look what happens in the dinner party. Then someone comes to you and is like, um, sorry, this isn't the right seat. And in front of everyone, you have to move down. And that's humiliating and it's hard. It just creates more harm, he's saying. So he's saying, so here's a better way to enter dinner parties and really all of life. Come humble. Come open. Come with what in other traditions would be called beginner's mind. Come with a sense of, you know what? I can need healing and help and there's more to grow and learn and discover. He says, when you come that way, well, then what happens is that you get lifted up. You get to receive, to, to connect back with the image from Jeremiah in the ways that there's the holes, the cracks. Well, when we come with humility, we receive the healing, the mending. doesn't mean there still aren't little cracks or holes or more that can come, but we're entering into the process of what heals and helps us better hold the living water of God's generosity and justice and joy and bring it as fountains of living water into the world. And so Jesus is inviting us into that. Jeremiah was inviting his people into that to recognize you are living in ways at times, cracked pots, holes in your bucket. That's part of the story, but there's a better story and it's a true story. And that is that you are magnificent manifestations of the divine. You are meant to be vessels of the very living water of the spirit of God and not just for your own benefit, but to be fountains of that that water the world. I, I, I was gone for two weeks. I got to see some of the monsoon, but I was gone for two weeks, and I came back, and the Catalina Mountains? What? I saw in, in today's Arizona Daily Star the political cartoon, which wasn't very political today. It called the Catalina's two sons Chia Pet. Chia, Chia, Right? But it was just like, look what water can do. I mean, this explosion of life. And the flowers and the more birds and the wildlife out there and yeah, insects too. But it's their chance to do their thing, right? It's just boom. And that, so they lived in a climate more like ours, the people in these stories. So they got it. Boy, when you aim that water, when you bring it to where it's needed, boom. It transforms the landscape. But we can't do it if we just try to suppress or ignore the holes in the bucket. I was one time in the very beautifully remodeled lobby of a nonprofit organization where I was a volunteer. And in the space, because it was sort of the reopening, in the space was this man who had donated his expertise, labor, time, and materials to make the renovation happen. And he saw me and he came over and gave me this big hug. We knew each other. And I was commenting on how beautiful the space was and so thankful for what he did. And then I asked him, I said, have you always been generous like this? And he said, oh, heck no. So he used a stronger word. He said, six years ago, I would never have done this. I would know how. I, I know what I know. But I was so much in my own pain and selfishness and just trying to take care of my nearest and dearest there would have been no capacity for something like this. He said, I believe there was goodness in me. He said, but I was so broken, it just all leaked out everywhere. But six years ago, he said to me, is when I hit bottom and I entered into recovery. And he said, in, in working 12 steps, I met a higher power who saved my life. And then after about a year in recovery and a year of sobriety, I started to ask, well, is there more to this higher power than just helping me survive and, and, you know, not be in my addiction? So I joined a church. He said, and then I learned more, and there was more, and I started to experience in that community more healing. He said, I still got lots of cracks, but there's also been mending and healing. So he said, I'm just a better container than I used to be of God's goodness, and so I got more goodness to share. 
I think that's how it works. So we already know that kind of default old story of the broken, the painful, and all that's true. It's part of the story. But just living into that or leaning into that or being in denial about that gets us all the things we really don't want. We already know what, what helps the world be compressed, depressed, oppressed, suppressed. And so we're hearing today a reminder that we can live a better story, a very true story, that each day we can turn from the less than the whole and in the ways that we know how, whether it's your meditation, prayer, yoga, contemplation, walk in the beauty of this creation with a dear friend, sharing a meal, whatever it is, whatever practices help you receive that living water, well, then there's more of it to share. And then we are those fountains of justice and joy and generosity in the world. And I don't know about you, but I've noticed the world could use that living water, yes? Can somebody say amen?